we finished that first episode. And I guess what I don't want to do is deliver some sort of uh, assessment of the game. Um, either as a text or as, you know, our experience and, you know, deliver sort of the thumbs up, thumbs down or the this many out of that many sort of analysis, all of which I hate. So I'm going to look at this more in terms of um, my aesthetics coming in and seeing how it's been. Now, it could well be that after playing a few more episodes, I'll look back on this and say, okay, so that's what it was like when I didn't understand. So this isn't really about like what the game does or does not do or what the people who know the game well would or would not do or anything like that. One of the aesthetics that um, I bring in um, has a little bit to do with weird... Uh, histories of manhood in uh, both American television and in uh, science fiction, particularly of this period. And it may seem a little odd if you have this history in your mind of just sort of, uh, you know, toxic masculinity progressing through steps of, you know, increasing and problematic improvements, you know, to the present day where one may perceive oneself as, you know, past all that. Um, that's not really, I think, the way it was, and for that matter, is. One of the things that has always struck me in watching um, a fair amount of the old Trek, as well as a fair amount um, of the material of that time, especially because TV was subject at that time to so many ridiculous ridiculous and massaging and stifling effects. Uh, Nielsen ratings are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's some really interesting histories I've learned too that, that factor into this. Okay, now I'm going off on my tangents. All right, good enough. That's what you get. Play Trek, go on tangents and everybody's saying, but Ron, does the game suck? You know, hoping for the, you know, the bon mot that can be tweeted or something. Well, too bad. We'll go off on a little historical cultural talk right now. Um, you probably don't know, he said, reflecting his didn't know until a moment ago, um, last couple of weeks, uh, the full or at least a more complete history of Lucille Ball. Now, as a kid in the 70s, a preteen basically in the 70s, I was, um, you know, no, nobody escaped I love Lucy. It was just on all the time. Everybody knew it. It was a constant cultural reference. Um, it, it was basically a prevalent piece of the culture. And I did not know uh, how early that show started. It's a late 50s show and not, I mean, I guess I sort of naively thought of it as a 60s show um, that was in reruns, much like Star Trek. Uh, was a, a mid '60s, late '60s show, and then was in reruns, and uh, hadn't really, you know, counted on my fingers or realized what was going on with that. Now, of course, anybody watching the old Star Trek back then was familiar with the, the Desilu Studios logo, and um, what that even means, right? Um, Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, you know, for Desilu, and what we're really looking at is something of the TV equivalent of Motown Records, um, where author or rather you know creative control over production was if not seamless flawless or you know free of all ills was still very much not the way everyone else was doing it and basically elbowed its way into prominence through you know i venture to say you know, determination, ruthlessness, and in fact, quality of product. So the, the question then is, what does this have to do with Star Trek? Well, Star Trek was filmed um, there. And in particular, um, without going into the history of that I've learned, you know, about the studio and so on, but you should know that the studio closed during the run of Star Trek. And as I've mentioned before, the final productions, uh, all 
if or most of the third season being sort of bootlegged out of a technically closed or closing studio um really put star trek into a different position first of all being there at all uh second then being sort of off the leash um and and, and out of gas um for that last part but the important point for me is that the writing uh could wander and go places now granted there were censors and granted there were standards and granted there were nielsen ratings and all sorts of things happening but even so a great deal of tv just like in all art forms when subject to these constraints finds all the crevices and ways to code and commentary and secondary lines and stuff like that or you know sneaking stuff in at the very end of the the shoot or you know post-production tricks or who knows what or the fact fortunately that anybody involved in censorship is ipso facto stupid um typically means that any body of art form uh is just full just full of whatever is on everyone's minds at the time and in the case of star trek i'm really focusing on the issue of manhood and a lot of the content uh addresses this i mean i really love the first official pilot uh where no man has gone before in which it is just all about what manness and power have to do with one another let's not forget that the first aired episode is called the man trap and has a lot to do with the self delusions and projections that men put toward uh people or memories that they value um and in in all fairness you know the the title's a little misleading because a female character is uh you know subject to the same trap um at one point in precisely the same way and a great deal of the other things are like that spock as a character just becomes an absolute discourse on you know uh the management of overwhelming emotion and this is even before a mock time which basically says "Ooh, look what we've been doing with the character let's just let's just <laughs> turn it up to 19 and take it from there um but even before that i mean there isn't an episode that goes by basically that uh doesn't tap into that and is often and i would say a fair amount of those first season episodes uh are centered on it so the interactions between uh kirk as written mccoy as written and depicted during that first season especially are not the buddy buddy um interactions that you see elsewhere and later as the the fan love for the characters and then projected onto them becomes you know overwhelming in those later episodes in the earlier seasons they like each other they've worked together a long time they trust each other but they are informal with each other you know the doctor has a nickname but they really get on each other's case and their differing authority um the, the doctor can override the captain and can remove him from duty um is handled particularly well and that occurs in the first season the groundwork for it and the, the depiction of it as plot is is frequent um and then the better episodes of the the later series uh and i speak of the second and third seasons of the original um really really get there um anthony has cited obsession in season two as a primary you know episode for him and i upon re-watching it just cannot disagree at all it is really a knockout episode and um really depicts you know how these three guys who do have a professional and personal you know relationship um have to cope with disagreement and fear for or of one another um and it's it's actually pretty solid so i don't know just you know how much one would expect a game that is inspired by the larger franchise concept of star trek could possibly address this except simply as the fact that we're just bringing it in as characters that we made three extremely manly characters i have to say um and that's why i'm saying it matters i mean if we hadn't then 
this all would it be just some sort of you know private musing about old star trek but here i look at our game i look at the characters i look at what's going on and i say all right we got three men and we and then things expand quickly um for relevant characters um for the male ones people like uh, um Mbuto and um Mondragon, a couple of others and then some female characters who as we have at least depicted or made them up uh seem to be very well uh what's the word i want they, they they know what they're doing in the context of the interactions that i'm describing they know how to handle it or they know how to you know take charge in it or they know how to uh simply cope with it you know as a reality although we haven't really seen any um sort of behind their eyes look from them but i really think that that without too much reaching that one can look at the what we've got there as fiction and see that this is on the table now let's go to the game and one thing that we've done is uh progress through the assessment of a given episode we did it for the pilot and we're about to do it for the the, the first official episode and i'm not really saying that i have a grasp on it through use i mean one and about to do the next is no way you know educational or fully educational um and isn't subject to my judgment as quality um experientially i found that the the text version uh, which I went over first, really focuses on basically addressing to the player, can you, do you uh, have, you know, a stand, you know, live up to or, or care or are worthy of, you know, Starfleet standards of conduct and mission. It's, pretty idealistic toward those things and i know you know or learned that anthony didn't follow those basically because he thought they they didn't suit and i guess you'll have to ask him you know whether he even likes them or not i can tell you i don't look playing the core text um advancement slash assessment method i mean the method's okay i like the method fine you know you assess whether your character did this and whether your character did that and how they relate to the mission and stuff like that and then there's various other things the that the gm or i think sort of group ish is assessed but effectively um improvement in the game is tied to challenging the improvement in the character is tied to challenging your values which i think is pretty cool and then uh advancement in rank um, or being busted in rank is very much a matter of your conduct and the mission. Now, again, I've spoken before about how I feel rank is the the least important, or the, I I feel the least strongly. That's the best way to put it. I feel the least strongly about rank as a, a fictional um, concern, uh, as a context for characterization, plot, you know, activity, and all that. Is context? It's fantastic um as me as a player going oh no i hope i don't lose rank for this or oh boy i hope i get promoted for this or something like that just uh, my recoil from that mode of thought is drastic i mean really drastic and so the book sort of emphasis on this as oh this is a big deal you know i'm kind of going well fuck that noise so anthony didn't use those rules or at least not in full apparently in the klingon book there is a completely different or at least differently phrased or structured um version for the klingon characters and he i think took that that rubric or that structure and then is sort of adapting it a little bit so we're kind of getting you know advancement slash assessment mechanic you know shea boyd uh for star trek and once you start getting there we are sort of looking at soft you know utility-based game design 
Um, and I can see why Anthony's doing that. And it makes a lot of sense, but it's a work in progress. So I don't really know. I'm really interested to know, okay, how are we going to do it for moving into episode two? I, I would like to, I'm not, what's the word I want? I'm not, uh, demanding about that. It's like, all right, what do you got? You know, it's more like, all right, this is, you know, Anthony's working this out and figuring out the, the theme that expresses what we're doing here and how that relates to any other aesthetics that we have in mind, especially regarding, you know, this setting. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and that's as far as I'll go. I can't, you know, judge anything about it yet. I can just know that I looked at those rules in the core book and I just, my heart sank and I was like, Oh, so it was really nice not to have to quite do that. We'll see how much more we don't quite do that or whether we stick with what he landed on for the first round of it. Um, other factors and assessments. Um, some of them are personal. I'll leave those for private conversations. Some of them are, um, you know, still thinking about the overall, the big currency of the game, which is of course threat and, um, to a lesser extent momentum because momentum kind of comes and goes threat just kind of gets up there and doesn't go quite so far as to, uh, metastasize necessarily. Um, but it is notable that a lot of the reactions to your results do involve, you know, throwing in more threat as I understand it. And as we discussed before, uh, maybe a fair amount of that is involved with graying the scenario. Um, and also kind of closing it, the, the, the reversal technique, the reversal application of threat has now been used for both of our episodes. And I don't really know, you know, how an episode goes without a reversal. Now, um, we had to, you know, basically, we actually whittled down a lot of the threat and I was, you know, I think we had two left or something. And I was kind of looking at it going, Ooh, wow. Are we going to actually resolve this epi episode by, solving all the threat and does that mean that we actually close out then i mean i don't know the rules for gming specifically so at least hypothetically i was like okay so when you know threat hits zero you know the gm's out of threat i mean is it time to close i i don't know um but i will say that it didn't quite happen that way a few bad rolls threw us into the zone of having to pile on threat um, and considering the circumstances, I just didn't want to move toward, you know, I was saying earlier, I really like complications, you know, things go right badly for you and you end up with more complications. And I like those, but on the other hand, you know, toward the end of the episode, the last thing you need is more complications. And so, um, that means if you end up with a lot of tough rolls at that point, they pile into threat, then that means that you're looking at a reversal. And as I say, that kind of morally graying of the whole thing. And I, like that as an idea um in practice having seen it twice i'm kind of going hmm all right i want to see how it goes you know through the vagaries of play and roles i'll look forward to seeing how it goes differently structurally speaking before i really you know have an opinion um but we've definitely seen it go that way two times and i'm kind of wondering all right how does it go some other way um, and what are the, the rules, you know, for, for all the ways, um, in which threat either increases rapidly at the end or decreases rapidly or rather, you know, is, is whittled down or any of those things. So it's a question I'm interested, looking forward to it. Um, so now with just two player characters, by the way, or rather two players, uh, plus the game master, we have a slightly different dynamic going on. A lot more of the supporting characters are going to be played by a lot fewer people. I'm not sure whether that's, you know, good or bad. I'm interested, you know, and as always, just to see what effect that that has. Um, and it's also notable that we no longer have a player character in the, uh, in the, in the captain's role. Um, in terms of the game mechanics, it's not just a rank. I mean, you have these roles that characters 
have. Um, so that will be, you know, an, another sort of it, playing the captain as an NPC, which none of us can play, or I think very rarely. I think Anthony clarified in the middle of the episode that he can, in fact, give over an NPC to a player electively, um, as opposed to supporting characters that the player just goes, oh, playing that guy now. Um, so who knows? Maybe, you know, Telic becomes more of a, of a of a joint PC to a great extent between Casey and me, or whether, you know, we have an interesting situation of the NPC in that role, probably moving more of the plot significant, you know, biz decisions to our stations. Um, the game doesn't really seem to be built for, you know, not having a player character in that role. I mean, I read it and I say, oh, you don't have to have a captain in that role. In fact, I love the idea of a captain as a, as a uh, supporting character. So you get kind of a composite captain um, that everybody else kind of has to cope with. Sort of like that idea. But, you know, that's what I get when I'm reading it. But nothing in the book seems to go that way. And there's a real strong presumption that, you know, playing the commanding officer is very exciting. You know, someone's going to want to do it. So um, I don't see a necessarily a reason to have anybody in that role. But we're moving into sort of a gray or unknown territory as far as the book is concerned when we do it. Um, all told though, um, this, there's a lot of grist going in experientially for me and, uh, another round through an episode, um, will definitely, uh, you know, will definitely grind a fair amount, maybe into more coherent or considered opinion you know, as opposed to just raising more questions. All right, then, uh, on to episode two, I presume.